chapter 3, The Whispering Past. In sanctimonious stratotones, the general voices his grave concerns. The children are all waking up, they should be fast asleep. The furling awareness and furling strong like strands of life and strands of light. Resewing and restitching fire, the Gnostic flame relit. The serpent hiss, the whispering past, the bringer of the mystic path, the metal click, the open latch, and shining light divine. On those receiving and those denied, and those who felt their life was done, will find the glory once again, and see the way ahead. And all must listen to words being said, and spoke through sage and Iliad, and words that rise from silver box, and all but one is left. Going native is strangely stimulating once you have gotten over the initial shock. I'm not sure that anyone post Mecca would, or could, ever share in my sentiment. It's addictive what the Mecca offer their ultimate creation and everyone is dependent on it to some degree well they've known nothing else have they the sweet digital candy the sensory curves that maintain those empty highs for the longest time but to someone who's experienced the world pre-singularity which from what I've learned is possibly only yours truly there's something of the old ways surviving in the debris and in the aftermath. Okay, it is but a mere whisper spoken softly through the stone, but it's undeniably there. A sense of hope in the rubble? That might be too optimistic, but certainly the sense of a more solid world, a more analogue world with analogue honesty. That's the foundation, surely, a sense of real honesty and a simpler life made of bricks and mortar and flesh and blood and bone and none of that synthetic food for synthetic bodies crap. Plastic egg, better than the real clucking thing. Yeah, right, that shit will make your stomach go stiff. It's only meant for plastic stomachs, after all. You could say, I don't have the stomach for plastic egg, quite literally. And in all honesty, a true archaic like myself will quickly fall away from the fixed point generation and the electronically painted surfaces that have no bearing and no place in the physical dimension. A deceptive ghost of a world slapped on top of the world that everyone's discarded is far cheaper than rebuilding, plus Bonus feature, anyone who disconnects, whether we're talking actual mecha generation or black grid, what's left for the senses is pretty close to a bomb site. In other words, how the world looks, how the world feels, keeps everyone hooked in on some level and addicted to the tech. Clever, cunning. And I'm not convinced that Black Grid is as safe and silent as it used to be. Don't trust it. Can't trust it. How can I? If it's not physically tangible, then I don't see how anyone could completely trust this digital meshing, this augmentation that everyone takes for the real thing. The ultimate denial that has gotten into the bloodstream of Synthetica and Carbon alike and the everything's in between. Prove to me a chair is a chair. Old school philosophy. There's a lot to be said for the deep thinkers. We need some of those guys now. Hood, Eliot, Socrates, Homer, and on our side. Finding a small sandy trench, I crouch down and rest and become part of the landscape beyond and a part of the beach terrain. I become invisible in a different kind of way, and in a way that I even lose my perceived identity. I fancy that I am the dust that sweeps towards and around my shallow grave. I fancy that I am dissolving into the sea spray, 
the yellow mist and the beach broth foam. There's a shift of energy, I feel it, and there's a sense of movement to the rear. There are raised voices and distant screams taken by the wind, and then a shrieking. A lady's petrified voice is overtaken and ghosted by the horrors that must be following. And then the relative silence prevails once more, apart from the sound of the raw elements, the wind, the ocean, the onset of rain, a little thunder rolling through the darkening clouds above. There's no way of calculating how far off the ungodly activity is. It could be 80 or 90 strides away, or it could be several miles. The wind distorts soundscapes and distances alike, and without any form of measuring tech, I am left to my guessing games. I hope several miles. I'll wait. Can't take to a sprint before knowing the lowdown and the dangers involved. Just get me home. I mutter beneath my breath. I'd rather sleep right here and make tracks in the morning. I would, if such a course of action meant securing safe passage. They'll be concerned back at camp if I'm gone for too much longer. Maybe Virgil is safe now and his carefree ways have paid off. Maybe he's explaining my plan to get back and inform the unit, my family that I'll be fast behind and arriving quite soon. Maybe I should have simply run after him and took my chances and thrown caution to the wind. Not my thing. I weigh the odds and play the probability game. It served me well so far. It has. In fact, it's kept me alive. There's nothing I can do until the dangers have passed. For a moment, a fleeting moment, there is something recognisable on the putrid breeze. Not the smell, no, something of a familiar nature in the moving air and carried in the broken convection of the planet. I'm looking way off into the distance, away from the modern city behind me and into the past. From my current viewpoint, South is future and north is past. The structure that caught my eye is a large enclosure with tattered exterior and weathered thin metal sheets that are all coming loose from too much time and from neglect. They are all flapping in the wind and eerily bouncing the dim light. The sound carries in pendulum type fashions as the wind changes direction like a transparent juggernaut turning on a coin, the rumble of a bruised and weeping ocean forever underneath the dystopian sonic arama.